or the commonly used form uh, that's used in clinical trials of mm. omega-3s is very different to a natural form of omega-3 to get you, you get from your diet. Everything in extreme, it, it shouldn't be done for long term. And a lot of patients get benefit from the carnivore diet, but really not long term. A look into these studies and also understand their weaknesses and what they're not revealing, not just these flashy headlines that have come up from these studies. I and mean, people mm -hmm. you know, can grab a study like uh, the one on colorectal cancer and go, see, all saturated fats are, uh, are fine. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It, it's really up case by case. It's the patient, it's the age, it's the sex, it's the diet, it's the holistic picture. Okay, Shannon. Thanks Hello, Brad. Thanks us again. And, um, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about those fat studies. Yes, yes. So a couple fat. of studies have Evil come fat. my way um, regarding fats uh, and really going against the, the norm, really, aren't they? They're talking yes. about saturated fats in colorectal cancer being uh -huh. beneficial. Omega-3 fats, which we know can be beneficial for heart health and mood and so forth, many things. Have, uh, there's a study showing that they can be detrimental causing atrial fibrillation. So I want to discuss these studies with you, mm. but also in a broader sense, fats in general, because there's a lot of, um, I don't want to use the term misinformation uh, because it's too, too commonly thrown around, uh, but it can be very confusing, uh, not only for the layperson out there, but for us practitioners too, because there's mm -hmm. a myriad of evidence that uh, can say one way or another. And I think it'll be good to clear up. What do you find is the most misunderstood fact about fats and health? I think most of the viewers would see advertising in foods and they say things like low fat or this fat is bad, that fat is good. And these two studies that we're going to talk about is exactly that because one we says it's really supposed to be good for you, but it's linked to atrial fibrillation in the heart and the other saturated fat, which is supposed to be bad, is actually protecting from bowel cancer. So this is why we're discussing this for you out there. But I guess um, common misunderstanding is just there's more to it than simply black or white good and bad that's right yeah there's a lot of nuance and uh you know mm. we can't just label all, all fat is bad it's really yes. ridiculous that that uh labeling really became into prominence in the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. it was strongly pushed uh and you had this this whole low fat revelation uh revolution i should say um, that was really incorrect uh, because there's so many good nutrients that uh, we we get from our fats. You know, all our, our fat uh, soluble vitamins, K, yes. E, D, A. Uh, so you know, it's it's an important part of our uh, diet. And but there can be issues with certain fats, or there's detrimental fats that can um uh you know mainly trans fats i think that's, yeah, that's really ones. Yeah. and when we're looking at hydro hydrogenated oils and so forth and again it usually points back to really bad processing um and mm -hmm. you know finding these commonly in uh, highly processed or ultra processed foods junk foods mm -hmm. and so forth uh are mm. going to be bad for you and mm. anything in high amounts is generally going to have detrimental effects and that's when what really points to i think some of these studies too in particular the mega-3 one they talked about there's a potential issue in regarding the dosage being so high because this sort of thing wasn't shown to come up in dietary intakes of omega-3 plus also the um, ester form or the commonly used form uh, that's used in clinical trials of mm. omega-3s is very different to a natural form of omega-3 to get you, you get yes. from your diet. Uh, yes. And that may um, be a concern as, as well. Some factors that probably weren't taken into consideration and highlighted like they should have been, you know, including mm. the, when some of the uh, patients that um, who weren't taking omega-3 when they die you know if 
atrial fibrillation is coming on uh, after the age of 70 and the omega-3 um, patients were living till 80, 90 years of age mm -hmm. and the non-omega-3 groups um, of patients were dying before the onset of atrial fibrillation that usually comes on, then we're going to see a very skewed results as, as well mm -hmm. and they mentioned that being um, a concern a, a, as well in that study so um, yes. and yeah we've got the saturated fats seem to be health promoting uh, but mm. um, the as they, cancer. yeah as they mentioned that there could be dairy um, d dairy has been shown to be health promoting in, in certain tests uh, uh, certain um, studies as well and they yes. they'll point to that might may be uh yeah. where the saturated fats might be showing a benefit um so yeah there's you know we've got to look into it take a bit more of uh, a look into these studies and also understand their weaknesses um mm. and what they're not revealing not just these mm -hmm. flashy headlines that have come up from these studies and people mm -hmm. you can grab a study like uh, the one on colorectal cancer and go see all saturated fats are, are fine you know there's no issue there um and of course it's a it's an individual thing too and there's different types of saturated fats so um mm -hmm. even even within plant foods like coconut oil versus the yeah, uh, cacao batter or something like that then and stearic mm -hmm. acid doesn't raise raise cholesterol but saturated mm -hmm. fat and coconut oil will so um you know that's that's you know pointing towards heart health issues and that's a whole different kettle of fish too so yeah what are your thoughts on on the the nuances in within these studies and when we talk about fats in general yeah i couldn't agree more with all of that but more has to be uh studied and we dig deeper but it's great to see this information coming out and flipping all the old research not on its head but helping us ask questions about it and there's more to it and I think we, we don't know why it is. There was some theories in the study discussed um, about the mucus producing cells, if I remember rightly. And <clears throat> just like you say, the differences between animal and plant. And we don't know how deeply of these participants what they were eating. I mean, how much coconut oil? Were they putting it in their coffee? Was coffee a part of it? Were they eating lamb mm -hmm. or were they eating pork? <clears throat> um, yeah, there's and I so think much they mentioned it. with the coconut oil too that that did have benefits um, in this with the saturated fats in the colorectal cancer. Uh, but we know, for example, that contains caprylic acid for, and that can be antimicrobial and have benefits on the microbiome mm. um, mm -hmm. to a certain degree. But there has yeah. been other research showing that coconut oil can be detrimental to um, certain strains of microbiota in the microbiome as well. Mm -hmm. So you get, mm -hmm. you're get you getting conflicting evidence either way here too. Mm. So, yeah. But for me, with my patients, I'm always going back to basics and saying, uh, you know, whole food in moderation, common sense things. Yep. And if we think back to our ancestors, our ancestors' ancestors, eating a whole food diet was a great thing but more than ever food is so heavily processed now mm. and um, just like the second study with the the omega-3s and the processing of it these seem to be more of the issues where we concentrate and make mega dosages of a particular constituent like the epa with an attempt to reduce inflammation or something but then there's that throws the whole system out so yes. If we, if you, the viewer out there, think, okay, we'll just keep it simple. Uh, at this point in time, is the best, probably the best way, and don't go too crazy out um, concentrating anything without a practitioner to guide you. Mm. It's very important, but, and I think yes. when we, when high dose anything, like just like pharmaceuticals, you, if you're high dosing fish oil or other things, you need to be monitored. You need mm -hmm. to make sure that something like atrial fibrillation doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it will, and um, we've only got one study pointing to this. Usually high dose 
anything, whether it's supplements, pharmaceuticals, mm. you know, our herbal medicines, whatever, you want to do that for short periods. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not, you don't want to be prescribed a high dose of anything, and then all of a sudden you drift off, drift off and don't see your practitioner anymore, and you continue to take a high dose of something. Now there yeah. might be circumstances where long periods, like even for six months or something, with certain nutrients under certain conditions, you you might be looking at reasonably high doses. But even then, look. Uh, you know you'd like to if say for example i had patients on a high dose fish oil to reduce inflammation that's that's really what you'd be where you'd be high dosing you would only look at that for a short period and if you still feel like they needed more omega-3 then you would be looking at making sure that they're getting it from the diet uh, and other sources, not just high dose fish oils. And yes. uh, so, yeah, and I don't Maybe know. Bringing some herbs or other compounds and. Well, yeah, for, especially for reducing inflammation, you, you wouldn't be yes. just doing fish oil alone. Yeah, most have, definitely. Have you seen anything in clinically, like with regards to atrial fibrillation or. No, never, never. Adverse effects? But I think, yeah, if. Because we're seeing patients, it may be, um, it's a different scenario. Just like you say, we're altering the prescription and we're, uh, as the weeks go on, we're tailoring it for that patient and adapting and changing. So yeah. there'd be less chance of that to happen. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It, it's really up case by case. It's the patient, it's the age, it's the sex, it's the diet, it's the holistic picture. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, uh it just highlights the importance of that and food is medicine and uh and uh, don't stay on anything for too long i had a thought while you were talking about also the carnivorous diet um there's an example of a food not not exactly a therapeutic dose of something but everything in extreme it, it shouldn't be done for long term and a lot of patients get benefit from the carnivore diet but really not long term would it be linked to this saturated increased saturated fat component could it be a restriction on the uh fodmaps fibers or uh is it something else but uh all i'm trying to say is don't do everything in uh extremes and don't do them long term mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and or well, at least if you're not being monitored by a practitioner who knows what they're doing mm -hmm. and can can look out for certain signs and be doing regular blood tests for you or, or getting you to do regular blood tests and assessing them for you or even better functional testing where you're taking a, a look at things like like the mm -hmm. microbiome which when you do a dramatic shift in diet where you know shift to keto or carnivore you're going to see dramatic changes uh, and maybe we see down the track that especially with people with certain genes you know different genetic makeup might have uh, might benefit from a more meat dominant diet we just don't have strong research there to suggest that you know carnivore long term is going to be beneficial and you've probably had the same issues as i've had with clients coming to you saying you know, I've, I've gone carnivore um, and their hormones have been like way out of whack or their gut health and A, they might not have uh, transitioned very well, which is quite common when people jump on diets, especially if they, you know, an extreme one like that. And B, they might not be doing a healthy version of that diet. Um, see, something like carnivore, if you're, if you can't completely get off sugars, even though it makes no sense to eat sugar you know it's because it's not part of the carnivore diet it's one of the most strictest diets and i've seen people want to jump on board with carnivore and it's like well hang on you're struggling just to take out a few foods i'm recommending and adding in a few good ones you know if you go something like carnivore or you know you might be limited to just a slab of meat and butter drizzles it on it you know and that's it so they can be very limiting uh and uh, you know as we both are big proponents of uh, good microbiomes healthy microbiomes and uh, microbiome diversity um you know have these really restricted diets including something like a fodmaps diet too 
you could have real detrimental health um, issues or health concerns coming up from really limiting the diversity of your microbiome with these extreme diets. All right. Mm -hmm. Just uh, again, your thoughts on the saturated fat being beneficial in the colorectal cancer patients? Because I know you've had uh, um, cancer patients in the past. I mean, you've done a lot of work in cancer compared to me. What are your thoughts on ideal diets for cancer patients who might have colorectal cancer? And what do you think are the benefits of certain fats in these diets? And maybe what's what would be some of the detrimental effects of certain fats diets with people who have colorectal cancer? Yeah, that's a really big question. Generally, I go back to a very standard diet and a common sense diet, like a paleo, whole food, lots of vegetables, lots of fiber. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't promote carnivore. Generally, I remove uh, inflammatory foods. Then you're thinking about, uh, there was some research came out about 10 years ago, I remember about uh, sausages and processed foods being, processed meats being linked to colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. And I put that down more to other factors like high salt or nitrates or uh, probably the, the makeup of the spices and things. So um, a lot of patients come thinking about um, going to a vegan diet. I actually don't promote that. Um, if they if they want to do that, I'll support them. But mm -hmm. I always go to a balanced diet, including some meat, because there are so many benefits to the meat. Um, I've never really focused on restriction of fats, um, especially saturated fat. So this study is quite interesting mm. to, to potentially increase more. But yes. uh, yes. I'm a big fan of ghee and lard mm. and and tallow and um <clears throat> having enough fat and not taking off the chicken skin mm. as some people have been told yep yeah so your um, your view is that it's other factors that uh, are contributing to poor health not not the not the fat itself um oh, it, great question yeah i've never made that link between fat as being a negative thing mm. for cancer yep um, maybe more the um, types of food being inflammatory, but not fat. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah, I've always seen them as intuitively important because they're the makeup of the food. If I always thinking of a chicken, I don't want to strip it down to just a fat free piece of chicken. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have the whole make a soup with the skin and everything. Mm. Even even back to um, organ meats as well, because back to our ancestors, I'm quite a fan of paleo foundation. Yep, ancestral um, diets. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and just keeping it real and whole and not cutting excessive anything out. Yep. Um, I don't know personally. I can't eat brain though, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it takes me back to that Indiana Jones movie. I think it was the second one in the series where they all sat down to uh, eat um, a delicacy, and they had the uh, the, the brains. And um, mm. yeah, uh, probably not something we need to talk about right now. I, I must <laughs> admit, I haven't had brains myself. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've had any organ meats. Okay, well, that's great, Shannon. Thanks for that insight. And uh, do you have any comments, uh, any more comments on those studies or fats in, in general? No, no, just uh, that we, we need to keep researching and reading and sharing and growing. And uh, the more we, we learn, the more we can help ourselves with our health. Yeah. And again, like everything, it's individual and you, you've got to find your diet for you that's going to work for you under your circumstances and, and uh, your needs. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there, Shannon. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. And I'll um, see you in the next one.